Kathy Johnson of Pyramid of Potential, and this is video 23 out of 60 of the Harnessing Learning Potential video series. This time we're talking about the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, or ATNR. This is normally present prenatally till about six months, and it's a really funny one. If you were to take a little baby and you've got him on his back, okay, he's lying on his back, and he hears a sound from over here, he automatically turns his head. And as he turns his head, he goes like this with his body so that this arm is straight, this leg is straight, this arm is bent, and this leg is bent. And same thing if he turns his head the other way. And you might wonder, oh, that's odd. Why would a baby need that? Well, one of the things, when the baby's on his back, and as he, he's all lying all kind of huddled like this, and as he turns his head, his arm starts to go out, and this is when they discover their hands. And their hand goes out, and it comes back in. And this helps him see near to far. So it has a developmental uh, vision issue um, going along with it. Uh, another thing is, if they're lying on their tummy in tonic labyrinthine reflex, remember that from two videos ago, they're on their tummy, and their shoulders are up, and their arms are up, okay, and their head is off the floor. And if they were to look to the side, because they heard a sound, they turn their head, and as they turn their head, this arm straightens out, this leg straightens out, this arm bends, this leg bends, and whoop, they're on the back, looking at the ceiling and going, how did I get here? And that's how babies learn to roll over. It's not something that they practice, like something's got to like happen and it's the combination of the two reflexes that helps them to learn to later on turn over. Um, so let's take a look at what can happen in this baby's body if uh, he retains this reflex, okay, and for some reason doesn't, doesn't integrate it on time. So the first thing uh, we see are visual problems, okay, convergence problems. And we were talking about that earlier with the tonic labyrinthine reflex, convergence not being able to cross the eyes easily. Now when a baby's real little, okay, and they're laying in mom's arms, they only need to see from here to here. This is as far as they see, okay, they, they can't see distance. But during the first year of life, as time goes on, this ability to diverge and see further and further away, uh, that improves and increases. So uh, by the time they integrate this reflex, uh, they actually can see a few feet away. One of the ways that babies integrate this uh, is through combat crawl. Okay? They're on their tummy and they're, they're crawling themselves along the floor. Uh, in order to be able to do that, um, they need two things, strength, which they get through tonic labyrinthine reflex, but also motivation. They, they see their bottle two feet away. Now they're going to combat crawl over to it or a favorite toy. So that's the convergence issue there. Next, we see right-left confusion. Okay, so uh, having difficulties knowing their right from their left at the same time. You know, it's like, oh, give me a second. I have to figure it out. Uh, balance issues come up again. We see a difficulty with skipping and marching. The correct way to march is opposite hand, opposite leg. And yet, uh, when I'm screening a child and I ask them to march uh, in place, sometimes they do a puppet march where it's one side or the other instead of opposite. The correct way to skip is also a counterbalancing with the opposite arm. And instead, I'll have kids who will gallop, okay? And that's also one side at a time. Uh, I'll ask them to cross the midline, okay, and so make a big circle in front of you. Now for some of you, you might not realize this, but the midline is this invisible line through here. And some people have difficulties getting one side of their body over to the other and past this midline. So I'll ask them to draw a big circle in front of them, and the kids who have this issue will draw a big circle in front of them. See? Not crossing the midline. Another thing um, you might see, uh, mixed dominance. Um, 
like they might be right eyed, left ear, right handed, left foot, or whatever. And uh, so we'll be talking a little bit more about um, dominance uh, a little bit later. We also might see some uh, visual perceptual difficulties. This is mixing up B's and D's, for example, where they say this is a B and the ball is on the right hand side of the stick, but this, which looks exactly the same actually, is a D and the ball is on the left hand side of the stick, and this, which looks the same, is a Q and this is a P. And so for some people, they haven't developed, mentally developed their brains to the point to be able to see that this is actually different than this. They kind of see everything all together and don't have a way of grounding that information. We're going to stop here for just a minute and talk about several of these, these issues. And um, so if I were to ask you uh, the, about the hemispheres of the brain, first of all, the left hemisphere, do you know what side of the body it controls? Right, it can, the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body, and the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. Very important. So if we were um, able to march correctly, we would actually use both hemispheres of the brain. Skipping, both hemispheres. Crossing the midline, both hemispheres. Even knowing this, okay, if that requires both hemispheres in order to orient, have orientation and same thing with um, left and right, knowing the difference and being able to quickly have that access. So what part of the brain is the part of the brain that is the communicator and the connector of the two hemispheres of the brain? It's the corpus callosum. And during this stage of development, it appears that this must be when that corpus callosum uh, starts to get developed. Because what you see after someone integrates their, um, their asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, we're getting more and more connections between the, the sides of the brain and we're able to overcome these issues that we're seeing that have to do with one side or the other. Another one of the symptoms of a retained ATNR is poor handwriting. So we teach the kids in school to have good handwriting posture. And let's pretend that I'm Johnny. I'm learning disabled, I'm smart. Um, I do everything the teacher tells me because I don't want to get in trouble. So teacher says, good handwriting posture, sit up straight, feet on the floor. Okay, paper right in front of me. And um, because I have a retained ATNR and cannot easily cross the midline, I can't get beyond here, so all my handwriting is down on this side. A lot of you have seen that. Now I'm getting in trouble. Teacher says, got to hit the red line. Okay, well, I don't want to get in trouble, all right? So I can, I can break a reflex for a short period of time if I concentrate. So I can get over to that red line. But because it's a reflex that I cannot help, I can't maintain that. And so an awful lot of times what you'll see is the student starts writing here, comes over to here, and the rest is down over there. Okay, so teacher says I have to hit the red line every time and I don't want to get in trouble. But I'm smart. I might have learning disabilities, but I'm a smart kid. So I go, ah, I've got it. I know how I can reach the red line. I can reach the red line and, and it'll still be comfortable if I move my paper over. Figured it out. So he, he starts off at the red line, but as he writes across the page, what happens? Well, he's watching, he's watching, he's turning his head, and as he turns his head, he goes into ATNR. This arm is straight, this leg over here is straight, this leg over here is bent, this arm is bent, and I look cool. That would be fine if I was in middle school or high school. But what if I'm in elementary school? Getting in trouble. Getting in trouble again. Teacher says, you've got to sit up. So I sit up. Okay, now I can still reach my paper and I can go here to here, but guess what? That's not good handwriting posture. I'm getting in trouble. Teacher says, I've got to have my paper in front of me. So in order to have my paper in front of me, 
okay? And it's still over to the side so that I can reach it all and I can get to that red line. I've got to break a reflex that I cannot help by bending my arm and using those muscles against a reflex. I remember it's a reflex. And that's how I can start to write. And something's got to give, okay? What's going to give is handwriting and also uh, my ability to be creative with my writing and think of the things that I want to write. By the way, what am I supposed to be doing with this hand? Oh, that's right. It's supposed to be straight and holding my paper so that this one is bent and I can have good handwriting posture. So, all I want to do is this, but good handwriting posture means this. All right? That's one of the reasons for poor handwriting. And we've already talked about several of the others. Uh, go back to the Palmer reflex if you wanted to see more on handwriting. So the last symptom of a retained asymmetrical tonic neck reflex is poor expression of ideas on paper. About 98% of all writing done in schools is creative writing. The left hemisphere of our brain is where we keep language. And that's controlled, that also controls the right side of our body. The right hemisphere is where we have creativity. The right hemisphere also controls the left side of our body. So let's say you are speaking to your student and you say, all right, let's brainstorm about what to write in your journal. And your student goes, blah, 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 blah. And you say, great. Now pick up your pen and write that down. And he picks up his pen and goes to write it down and nothing comes out. And this is because, um, let's say he's right-handed, okay? He, that means that he activates the left hemisphere of his brain because of the connection here. That means he has access to all those words, all that language. But what he does not have is access. It's as though it's shut off, access to the creativity. So he's got all these words, but all those great ideas he had just fell out of his brain. Or let's suppose he's left-handed. He picks up the pen with his left hand. He's got access to all these great ideas, but they're in pictures. And he cannot find those words because there isn't a good connection between the two hemispheres. Uh, in the schools, we use a really good um, a uh, really good accommodation, that's a keyboard, and as long as you're using both hands, you're also activating both hemispheres, and so you will see that the same student can get lots more out using the keyboard. So all of this has to do with that corpus callosum, and um, once we have started developing and maturing that corpus callosum, we have acti we have connections and communication between both hemispheres of the brain. And that's why you'll see a lot of changes happening just through integration of this particular reflex. Don't forget, this is the fifth reflex that I've been talking about as far as um, integration of um, reflexes for learning. And so don't skip the other ones. This may be really exciting. You might think this is it. This is the silver bullet. But you need to do the others either first or at the same time. So that's it. We have one more reflex to go over in the next video.